places here. Thank you. <laughs> um, some various uh, sort of background references, which is uh, some of them repeating what I had on the, oops, some of them repeating what I had on the uh, first slide, but with a bit more detail there. Um, and a link, another link to Warsaw with a, an old work with Pavel Narovsky. Okay, so um, let's go here. So the, the plan of today's lecture is going to be um, what's up there. So we, we came to a sort of picture, if you like, where we're discovering um, another way to look at these structures, um, space times or spaces generally. But in particular, if you want to look at conformal compactification, um, so we'll we'll develop that picture a little bit more, which is what this geometry of scale thing I'm going to talk about is. Um, <clears throat> then we'll look at hypersurfaces because typically um, when we're conformally compactifying, the boundary is going to be a hypersurface. So you want to get good at um, understanding hypersurfaces and conformal geometry. That's sort of obvious. Um, and it turns out that that's something you can study just independently. Um, and then we want to start this um, applications of those tools to, to um, <clears throat> understanding things at the space-time boundary. So there's, there's geometry and there's also these things like scattering that I'll talk about. Um, now, before I do that, so just in, in terms of the feedback, someone mentioned that um, perhaps the idea of densities would not have been absorbed completely. Um, so just to let you know that you probably know what I'm talking about, but just the language was different. So <clears throat> when you have a density of weight W, so here W is just a real number, <clears throat> you can also take densities to, to be um, have complex weights, but then we have to complexify the tangent bundle and stuff. So I'm just avoiding that. So we'll work with real weights. Um, <clears throat> and this is the way I'm treating it, this is an invariant object. So... So what, you know, you pick a section of this bundle. Um, so this is really a section, I suppose. <clears throat> um, then it's just invariant. But you can represent it in a sense, almost coordinatize it by picking a metric from the conformal class. So you pick a metric from <clears throat> the conformal class. Remember, this conformal class is an equivalence class of metrics where they're related by multiplying by a positive function. <clears throat> and then you can just represent this density by a function. Call it f. Um, and then what would happen if you instead picked a different metric from the conformal class g hat that was some omega squared times times g, <laughs> well, then you'd be representing this by a different function f hat, and that would be just, a, you know, um, this omega to the power of w times f. So, so you can think of um, a density as just a function when you pick a metric. And then when you when you change your mind about the metric and pick a different one, then it, it rescales according to that weight. Any questions about that? Okay, so the other thing I meant to leave as an exercise, but let me, um, or, or mention or leave as an exercise, but let me uh, just mention it now anyway. So remember we had this, so we wanted to, to sort of invent the conformal sphere or, or rediscover it. Um, in a sort of cunning way that, that is useful for us, the way we do it here. So we, look, we took this null cone, um, say with, this is in Romanian signature case, so the null cone, we have this Lorentzian signature metric in uh, D plus two. <clears throat> so we have the forward null cone, let's say, and then we ray projectivize it. So each ray <clears throat> becomes a point on the sphere. And then we talked about the compactification of hyperbolic space that way, but I meant to also mention the stereographic um, compactification. So um, remember, each section of this determines um, um, a metric on here. So when you take a section, it picks a metric on here. So if how do you get the Euclidean? <laughs> how do you get the Euclidean metric on here? How do you do stereographic projection? Okay, well, <clears throat> the Euclidean metric, so remember that this, let's do it in yellow, the scale tractor, 
it's going to, Euclidean matrix Einstein, so it's going to have some scale tractor, right? So, and the, and of course, the Euclidean metric is scalar flat. And I said yesterday that that I squared, <coughs> which is just the length of this as measured by the tractor metric, um, <coughs> is 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 something to do with the scalar curvature. So it's proportional to the scalar curvature. We'll do that in more detail today. So this should be zero. <coughs> This should be zero for the for the Euclidean metric, right? So, so that's telling us that we what we have to do. So, so the scale tractor just becomes a constant vector in this R D plus two. So what we have to do is just pick a constant, uh, sorry, a null vector in R D plus two. So, so pick a null vector. <laughs> so, so maybe I'm picking the one that's parallel to this to this edge of this cone, the, the null generator going up there. Okay, and then you look at and you look at these surfaces just like we did for the other case, I A X A equals one, and that'll be some sort of section like that. Okay, now that intersects intersects every ray generator, so it gives you it's going to give you a metric at every point on the sphere, except what? What's that? The pole, but in the picture. <laughs> that's right. It's going to miss the one that that is running up here that's parallel to I, because that you know because <clears throat> xa xa whoops xa ia is giving us that sigma. So so the <clears throat> so the so the xa uh, <laughs> so this is null anyway. So so when xa is is proportional to ia, then xa Ia is zero, and so you don't, you, you know, you're not on that section xaia equals one. So it's it's actually it's sort of obvious in the picture to you exactly missing one point, which is this pole. So, <clears throat> and you know that that's uh, the flat metric because it's it's conformally flat because it's part of this every 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 section of this is conformally flat. It's Einstein. <laughs> And the Ricci constant zero, so it's a Euclidean metric on there. Does everyone understand that? And you can see, you know, it, it's quite a simple way. And you can go backwards and forwards between thinking of these as tractors and just sec, uh, just vectors in there. And and both points of view are useful, so you can quickly come to conclusions. Okay. Now <clears throat> we want to sort of come back to that picture. Um, and generalize it a bit more because so far what I talked about yesterday was first of all the flat model like this, but also um, then, then we said, well, when when things are Einstein, it, it, it sort of looks a lot like the flat model, right? So when these eyes are parallel, then things start looking a lot like the flat model <clears throat> in that, you know, we got this result about how the how the zero locus of sigma looks like. Sig so sigma is the top slot of the tractor. So remember we have this, if you have one of these parallel tractors I, then what we're calling sigma to be XAIA. And then that's a density of weight one. <coughs> well, section thereof. Okay, and that zero locus, when I is parallel, is forced to be um, typically either empty, of course that can happen, um, or it can be um, a hypersurface, that's what happens mostly. And then <clears throat> there are a couple of other possibilities in Romanian signature, you can get isolated points um, and in, in other signatures, you can get something that's a hypersurface except at isolated points. But that's all Einstein, that's all when this is parallel. So we, you know, we obviously don't want to just restrict to Einstein metrics. So we want to somehow use this object. So let me come to the actual slides. So, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so this is the picture we had yesterday. So sigma is the top slot of one of these tractors. Um, <clears throat> and then when what we found out yesterday is if I is parallel, then I is necessarily give in the image of this Thomas D operator. So so <clears throat> what's happening there is that I parallel to the tractor connection, 
Okay, so that means it's covariantly constant with respect to this tractor connection. <clears throat> this implies that IA, <laughs> written with respect to some metric from the conformal class, looks like sigma, grad A, sigma, <clears throat> and let's just say rho, but the rho is minus one over T Laplacian <clears throat> sigma plus J sigma. So if I write rho, I'll usually just be, you know, it'll, it'll be abbreviating that. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> now what we want to do, oh, sorry, J is the trace of Scarton. Hopefully mentioned that yesterday. So, so this is the metric trace of Scarton. So I guess an indices J, A, B, P, A, B. P, A, B is the Scarton tensor. And I always remember what it is by comparison with the Ricci. I guess everyone here knows what the Ricci tensor is. So the Ricci is D minus two. Times, so let's put indices Ricci AB, D minus two PAB plus GAB J. <clears throat> okay, so it's a trace adjustment of the Ricci given by that formula. <laughs> and, and, and J is the trace of this. Um, <clears throat> capital X. No, no. So, I'll, um, yep, I'll, I'll come to that. So, so, yeah, so that's the trace of that. And I just wanted to say here that, that typically I will, you know, you could just use the metric here and that would really be the trace. Or we'll often use the conformal metric so it'll pick up a weight. The J will pick up a weight. So X, <clears throat> um, in the model, um, X was denoting the coordinates here. Yep. <clears throat> but we're also using it to denote in the model the Euler vector field, which would be <laughs> this thing. <clears throat> and in the curved case, for, the, for tractors on a curved manifold, <clears throat> X is is this uh, is this um, canonical tractor that gives the injection of densities of mate minus one into the tractor bundle, <clears throat> right? So in the flat case, <clears throat> the image of this is this tautological bundle, right? Exactly like in matrix talk, but you know we're working over the reals. So the, so the image of this will be a line bundle in here. And in the flat case, that's just the tautological bundle, sort of the bundle giving the homogeneous coordinates over the point of the, of the projectivization. But in the curved case, this thing's still there, and it's giving the filtration of the tractor bundle. It's the thing that's setting it off. And this is null. So there's a tractor metric around, and this is null. And that's reflected in the curve case, it's always null, but that's reflected by the fact that you're dealing with points on this cone in the curve case. And we use that notation X <laughs> to remind us of the model, right? Because a lot of things happen just like the model. There are other questions about yesterday or notation? Do, do slow me down because I've got stuff to give, but, it, but it, you know, there's no point. I mean, you know, we just do what we can in the time available. Yep, yeah. Yep. One metric out of conformal class, but if we allow for the full conformal class, then we have like a range of possible modifications depending on which metric we pick out of conformal class and the way basically captures this aspect. Right? In a sense, yeah, that's right. This this is a sort of fixed invariant object, but it has a weight now, okay. and that's that's reflecting this freedom of choice, if you like. But this the Ricci, of course, has weight zero. So if I use the conformal metric, um, that'll have uh, weight two. So this then has weight minus two. It's then the, it's then traced using the conformal metric. And the inverse of that has weight minus two. It's just, in one sense, it's like a bookkeeping. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so now, okay, so we want to move to the general curve setting and not require necessarily that the scale tractor is is parallel, 
Okay, so um, <clears throat> so we're actually going to define it. So remember, if it's parallel, it's in the image of this Thomas operator, like I'm trying to point out there. <clears throat> but we're just going to define the scale tractor to be that now, right? So when you pick a, a, a density of weight one and you do one over, <clears throat> you know, this one over the dimension and then this Thomas operator, then <clears throat> um, that that will we'll call that the scale tractor. In other words, when you write it in slots, it's going to be the scale that's giving you the metric you're thinking about. Um, or, you know, or it's not necessarily a metric, but zero, but the scale you're picking, it's derivative. And then in the bottom line, we have the second order um, <coughs> Laplacian acting on sigma. Okay, so it turns out to be, it's a good idea to keep that thing, even if it's not parallel. Right? So... Um, and one of the main reasons is it has a very strong link to scalar curvature, which we'll come to. <clears throat> okay, but before we do that, <clears throat> just to introduce a bit of useful terminology or something, um, <clears throat> although we're dropping parallel, we, we want some of the gains we had with that. So remember, if I is parallel, then because it's in the image of this operator, um, <clears throat> then if I is not zero, then the sigma's non-vanishing on an open dense set. In other words, it's non-vanishing almost everywhere, right? That's, think of a, an open dense set as being a set that's open and, and almost everywhere. So, um, so of course, if we drop that it's parallel, then, then <clears throat> that won't necessarily happen. But what we can do, and it turns out to be a reasonable thing to do, um, is just say that we will insist that this scale tractor is nowhere vanishing, right? So it's keeping part of the Taylor series of, of the sigma and asking that part of the Taylor series is not vanishing. So you'll have sigma, it's first derivative and a Laplacian on sigma is not zero. Okay, and then, <clears throat> so, that, so, so that's what I mean by um, almost pseudo-Romanian. So this term doesn't matter. Just think of it as temporary. You know, if you don't like it, it's temporary for these lectures. Just, just what it will mean is that this, scale tractor will be nowhere zero. So that's sort of the realm of things I'll be talking about. Well, it, it's going to be useful for that, yeah. So, yeah, the point I want to come to is, okay, there's no long white chalk, there's only long yellow chalk. Um, the... <clears throat> If you have a conformal structure, <clears throat> well, if you have a Romanian manifold, you can forget about the metric. So, so <clears throat> then the, the class of, of G is some sort of conformal structure, but you can start with a conformal structure. So then you only have an equivalence class of metrics where you can multiply or uh, by positive functions. But how do you go back? You know, what's the sort of good way to go back to having a metric? <clears throat> well, one thing is, is sorry, yeah. One thing is just to pick a metric from the conformal class and say that's the end of it, right? But <clears throat> this is not such a good idea in the sense that it's very limiting. So, so what I want to instead to do <clears throat> is to say, that will, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, we'll go to picking one of these scales or picking one of these scale tractors <clears throat> where this is nowhere, nowhere vanishing, right? <clears throat> so then we will have the scale that will determine a metric almost everywhere, but it, it generalizes it in a, in a useful way. So the sigma can have zeros. And it turns out that this is exactly the way that you want it for a lot of purposes like conformally compact manifolds. Okay, so you, so you can think of this scale tractor as, as point-wise breaking the conformal freedom. You know, <clears throat> you would have this coming from the sort of uh, Cartan bundle picture, which we haven't really talked about. You, you have this conformal group acting um, the SO, you know, depending what signature in, SO D plus one, one or SOD2 if we started an Lorentzian signature. And you know, point-wise, this is, this is lowering that to um, SOD1 or SOD, 1. 
Uh, anyway, taking one of the, <laughs> one of the, you know, it's it's lowering that Lie group uh, to act on 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 a space of one less dimension. Okay, so I'll, I'll say more about that in a bit. <clears throat> okay, so, um, <clears throat> so when you do do this picture like that, so what does conformally compact mean? So remember that I was talking about conformally compact. So it was a manifold with boundary. And this was given by a defining function and the defining function, you had had some metric you were thinking about to begin with on the interior. And then we had a metric that went to the boundary that this is, this, this is complete. So it doesn't go to the boundary. It becomes infinite at the boundary. And then we introduced another metric that was conformally related to that. So that G plus was r to the minus two of this metric to the boundary. And this is a defining function for the boundary. So, so this is where r equals zero, the boundary. And, and dr is nowhere <clears throat> vanishing along that boundary. So that was conformally compact. But in this picture, conform... Yep. Um, why, if i is nowhere zero, why can the sigma have zero? I mean, or, or do you mean by i being nowhere zero that it's non-zero on an open dense set? I mean, is that, is that uh, yeah, so 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 I is going to be nowhere zero, right? So so it's nowhere vanishing, but it could be that at some point it looks like zero grad sigma rho, and then sigma zero at that point. <laughs> it's part of the Taylor series, yeah. And you can even have you know when it's parallel to x, then what x is putting you in the bottom slot. So then it's zero zero that right. <clears throat> Good. Okay, so so that that remember was what conformally compact was, and that's this sort of picture is, has been studied, you know, for years and years and used all the time. So, in, what what is it in our picture? So it's an almost Romanian in this language. So it has uh, uh, one of these scale tractors that's nowhere vanishing, <clears throat> um, with the boundary just being the zero locus of sigma. <clears throat> Okay, so that's what conformally compact is going to become. Because we're always picking the metric in this picture by sigma to the minus two of the conformal metric. And we have a conformal structure. That's what we're assuming. So it's a conformal manifold with boundary. <clears throat> so it's a conformal manifold with boundary equipped with um, <clears throat> sigma such that sigma defines the boundary. But <clears throat> um, yeah, we, we will just... I'll say more about those things. So, okay, now the, <clears throat> the length of the scale tractor has to do with, um, get rid of some of those things, thank you, um, <clears throat> the scalar curvature, and I mentioned this yesterday. So let's, let's just see um, kind of slowly how that happens. Um, what can we best get rid of? It's here. <clears throat> this is kind of important because it turns out, you know, remember at the beginning I was saying to you, why, why does the um, conformal compactification of Euclidean space become one point? Why does the conformal compactification of hyperbolic space have a hypersurface on the boundary and so on? So this, <clears throat> this is uh, largely to do with scalar curvature. So, so <clears throat> and we'll see this here, right? So um, <clears throat> we want to take the length of the scale tractor. And I keep writing that as I squared. What that means is H A B I A I B, of course. I'm just, it's just an abbreviation for that. <clears throat> So how do I write that? Well, this tractor metric, it was kind of quick yesterday the way I gave it to you, but basically it's coming from having the metric or if you like the conformal metric in the middle here. I guess I'm doing the inverse, so I'll put that up. <clears throat> and then off diagonals like this. So it's like the identity in the middle and then these off diagonals. So um, if, if this has Romanian signature, this then has Lorentzian signature. So if, if the metric has Romanian signature, then this has Lorentzian signature. I'm sure you're familiar with that. 
Okay, so how do we take this length that way? Well, we put the sigma mu rho, and then just doing it like matrix multiplication. Oops, B A, I guess this time. <clears throat> and so what you get is um, two sigma rho <clears throat> plus G A B. <clears throat> well, so I put a mu here, but let's put grad B sigma. <laughs> A sigma. Okay, because we want this to be the scale tractor. So rho is going to be what I have over there as well. Uh, and so this will be G A B grad A sigma grad B sigma. Sorry, so the vector metric is one more minus index than the space time metric. Uh, exactly. Yeah. 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 So PQ. If that's the signature of your metric, then the other one is P plus one, Q plus one, the, the tractor. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so, <clears throat> so this is this is what I squared looks like. Okay, so we just calculate it. So two sigma rho times those things. Okay, so what you see, so this is I squared. <clears throat> So what's happening if I squared is not zero, right? So let, let's suppose that, well, what do I want to say first? Oh, I want to link it to the scalar curvature. So let's do that first. So, so um, when I expand out what rho is, so I get minus two over D probably. Tell me if I'm doing it wrong. <laughs> Laplacian sigma plus J rho plus J sigma plus, and then I'm going to have this GAB, grad AB sigma, grad B sigma. Okay. So first of all, so what is I squared then? So <clears throat> if we calculate in the scale of sigma, so suppose, suppose sigma is a metric, uh, suppose sigma is not zero, so suppose sigma is not not zero I, I i mean not vanishing so i'm just gonna yeah so i'll, I'll use that as a prevision suppose it's not vanishing it's even in an open neighborhood or something like that <clears throat> um then we can work in the scale of the metric g okay so but in that metric the levy sevita connection preserves sigma yeah so we said that yesterday so actually everything here is going to go away zero, 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 and we're going to get minus two over D sigma squared J. Now this is the weighted J. So sigma squared J, this is the slightly confusing thing about this notation, really is, let's call it J of G. It really is, you know, when I write it like that, it's now the unweighted uh, trace of Scouten as measured in the metric of G. Yeah. So the length of I squared is up to this minus two over D, just the trace of Scouten in the metric you're thinking about. Good. Okay, so that's, that's what's happening here, right? So that's what's talking about here. But of course, <clears throat> that was if sigma's not equal to zero, what happens if sigma is zero, <laughs> right? So suppose you're at one of these boundary points where sigma is zero, <clears throat> then, um, <clears throat> so now yeah, let's see, where should I put this? <laughs> so, okay, so, so over here, suppose <clears throat> sigma is zero at, at some point, at some point P, right? So, so now just at a point, <clears throat> then, What's going to happen? Well, this term's going to go away. So two rows six, so that that's zero. And we're just going to be left with that. So then I squared is going to be GAB grad A sigma, grad B sigma. Okay. In other words, it's in the same sort of notation, it would be grad sigma squared. So it's the length of, of Nabla sigma. So if I squared's not zero, then the derivative of, of, of sigma is not zero. So if you have a, 
conformally compact manifold um, where I squared's not zero, it's telling you that when you get to the boundary where sigma zero, that I squared is just grad of sigma squared. And so, so, so in particular, if you're in say Lorentzian signature or something, um, this, this is this number of sigma is not zero. What? In any signature. <laughs> so, but its length is not zero. So, so if I squared is greater than zero, then, then, then the, you know, this is like a normal to the boundary. Um, <clears throat> that is going to be uh, a space-like normal. So this, so the, if you're in Lorentzian signature, then the, the zero locus of sigma is going to be time-like. <clears throat> and the other way around. So if 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 I squared is negative, um, <clears throat> then um, if you're in Lorentzian signature, then <clears throat> where, where sigma is zero, that's going to be, grad sigma is going to be timeline. So the scalar curvature is, is telling you, um, <clears throat> in a sense, about how the boundary can look. And it's going to be, well, I'm going to come to that, so I'll, I'll say more about that in the next slide. <clears throat> so the main point I want on this slide is that this I squared gives you something smooth. So if you have a um, <clears throat> one of these conformally compact manifolds or any one of these, um, what I call almost um, pseudo Einstein manifolds, in other words, it's a smooth conformal structure with sigma picked, so this I is nowhere zero, then I squared is generalizing the scalar curvature and enabling you to, to, to talk about what happens to the scalar curvature even where sigma is zero and the metric is not defined. It extends it smoothly to those points. Is that clear? Because <laughs> because the, the, you know, up to a sign, this is the scalar curvature, it's polynomial in the jets of sigma, it's polynomial in everything, so it goes smoothly to, the, to those points. Use this one. Oh yeah, so just a couple of things there that I see on my slide. So, so the other thing is, you know, what does constant scalar curvature mean? So constant scalar curvature, well, it means literally that, that you would ask the, the scalar curvature to be constant, but you can generalize it and instead ask that this length of I squared be constant. So that's what in the past I called um, almost scalar constant, ASC, so almost scalar constant metric. <clears throat> Um, and by the way, um, a result that you'll know is that in dimension at least three, so if you're on a, uh, sorry, D is our dimension, is that? If D is at least three, then a metric being Einstein implies that the scalar curvature is constant. to make that little exercise, but that's just Bianchi. And this is Einstein in my sense, right? So the, the Ricci curvature is proportional to the metric. So the Bianchi identity tells you the scalar curvature is constant. So, the, so here we, we observe that this generalizes because almost Einstein just means that, that this is parallel. Yeah. But if uh, if this is parallel, then I squared is constant. Because the tractor matrix is preserved by the tractor connection. So if you're almost Einstein, then this generalized scalar curvature has to be constant. So it just generalizes that result also in dimensions at least three. Any questions about that? What's that? No, 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 no. So, you know, it's just like, a, a, you know, a Yamabi metric is a constant scalar curvature metric, you know, Romanian geometry, talk about that. That does not mean Einstein generally, yeah. There are results that if there is an Einstein metric in the conformal class, then the Obata theorem says that this, it will be that. Maybe that's confusing you. But no, of course, you can have constant, you know, that's one, one, one real function condition, constant scalar curvature, whereas Einstein is much more determined. 
Hmm. Things. There's this no, it's not. Looking at maybe when you fix the. <laughs> For some reason, when you fix one, that one. Because it... it switches between uh, zoom ah. and. Ah. Right. Sure. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, <clears throat> actually, I've already talked about a lot of this now, just over here. So, um, so what I want to say here is that, um, <clears throat> you know, we had this, what I call curved orbit picture in the case when I was parallel and we got a sort of nice picture about how the zero locus of sigma could be. Um, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll jump ahead. So, uh, right. So we had a picture like that. So, Last time we said that if I was parallel and and didn't have zero length, then it, then the manifold was divided into these parts, right? So and the zero locus of sigma had to be a smooth separating hypersurface. Um, and then, you know, on one side, you have sigma greater than zero. You get a metric determined away from that. It's conformally compact and even would have been, would be Poincare Einstein if, if this, if this I is parallel. So the point I'm making now is that you don't need I to be parallel. If I squared is not zero, um, and, and this is one of these almost uh, Romanian, in other words, you, you have the scale tractor, um, and if it's nowhere zero, then the zero locus is already a smooth separating hypersurface. Yeah. It's just automatic. So, um, <clears throat> so, um, you know, once you're away from the zero locus of sigma, so so sigma's determining a metric by this formula, you have the conformal metric everywhere, this bold G, because it's a conformal manifold, that's what we're assuming. Then we're looking at sigma to the minus two of that. Um, <clears throat> where sigma zero, as I said, by looking at this discussion that we had just here, which is also on the previous slide, um, <clears throat> where sigma zero, then if the length squared of I is not zero, then the derivative of sigma um, is is not zero where sigma is zero. Okay, so so the point is um, <clears throat> that we're getting so grad sigma is not zero point wise where sigma is equal to zero. Yep. So when that happens for a function, and then there's a thing called the constant rank. Uh, theorem, which tells you that the zero locus is a smooth hypersurface, all right? And here it has to be separating because <laughs> on one side of it, you know, the sign changes when the, when you cross sigma, if you have grad sigma not zero, the sign changes. And on one side you have plus and on one side you have minus. And this, these points where it's zero is the only place that can change sign. So it's separating, yep. <laughs> yep. Well, yeah, you can you can do a bit of this in the null case, but it gets more tricky, and you have to add extra conditions. So I don't want to I don't want to do that here because it's you know <laughs> a, a lot of effort per gain. But um, but yes, you can do more. But but really, what what I want to point out here is this is. You know, there's some sophistication in the notation and terminology, but this is really undergrad math <laughs> that's happening here. It's very simple what's happening. Um, and this is telling you why when you do a conformal compactification, you get certain types of boundaries, basically. So the point is that it, just as before now, if we throw away N minus and just keep the sigma equals zero and N plus, this is by construction a conformal compactification of that. So this is just the way of understanding. So all, all conformally compact manifolds can be thought of as arising from this picture. <clears throat> okay, so just to jump back, the previous slide was, was basically what I was already talking about at the board, right? So, so here's I squared, there's it written out fully. So where sigma is zero, that's curly Z's. Sigma means the zero locus. <clears throat> and then I squared just becomes the, the length of sigma. So <clears throat> um, if I squared... Um, is not zero, then in particular, um, so that means that the, the length of sigmas of grad sigma is not zero. So it means in particular grad sigma is nowhere vanishing, right? <clears throat> Along the zero locus. 
And so by this constant rank theorem, it's defining a hypersurface. So that's how you see that you get these smooth separating hypersurfaces. Any questions about that? Okay, so, um, too slow probably, but um, okay, so the moral is that, that you know, what we should do to, to understand these conformal compactifications again from a conformal point of view is, is introduce the scale tractor, right? And then um, we have the simple notion I was just talking about um, of, of, of what a conformal compactification is. So it's just a conformal manifold um, <clears throat> uh, uh, equipped with um, one of these scale tractors, a manifold with boundary rather, so that the, the, the zero locus of the top slot of I, this thing I'm calling sigma, defines the boundary. <clears throat> okay, now there's various things I want to come to, but this will be more later on, that... Um, so in pseudo-Romanian geometry, you remember if you go back to the start, I was saying that the metric produces the levi sevita connection. You can combine those to produce the Laplacian and so on. So um, <clears throat> this is the natural, these are natural operators made using Romanian geometry. Using this picture with the scale tractor and so on, there's sort of other natural operators we can make. And we will talk about one of these shortly. Um, but before we do that, um, as we've seen, um, hypersurfaces are turning up, these co-dimension one sub-manifolds. And I'm thinking of a boundary as being also a hypersurface in that sense. So we should, we should somehow um, get good at, at, at uh, treating hypersurfaces. Yeah, let's see. What, I'm not sure whether I should pause here or shortly. Yeah, perhaps. Uh, yeah, perhaps this is a reasonable place to pause. So we'll have a break now. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Start, so. People are still coming in. Okay, so um, as people come in, there, there was a question um, about the name tractor. Um, which is, well, you know, Poland's an agricultural country, so they'll understand. But um, so uh, the, the initial draft of this paper that was written with Bailey and Eastwood um, had, a, had a different title, which included the word twister. But the problem is twister is a bit sort of overused. And um, I think we were convinced at some drinks uh, in the south of England to change the name. Um, so... So, so vector, I think, if you look at its etymology, is something to do with pushing. And, and, and tractor, if you look at its etymology, is something to do with pulling. You know, so <laughs> these things <clears throat> sort of draw things, tractors. Um, <clears throat> but also, I mean, it kind of shares some of the, the twist of feel. But, but the, the other reason was that... Um, it was, in a sense, truly discovered by Tracy Yerkes Thomas. Um, <clears throat> and so it has the first bit of his first name in there. So that was that was the main argument. But actually, also, also if you read this backwards from there, it has the start of Cartan as well. So it's a pretty good name. Um, <clears throat> the, the latter thing wasn't part of the initial discussion, but it's true. Okay, so anyway, let's get back to business. Um, but anyway, I know you guys wouldn't joke about tractors. They're, they're pretty serious. Um, <clears throat> so we, we've, we've seen that hypersurfaces are turning up. So this means hypersurface for us means a just an embedded um, <clears throat> co-dimension one sub-manifold. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, so <clears throat> we'll always think of it as embedded, not, not sort of self-intersecting or anything like that. And so we, we need to understand these to, to, to sort of deal with the asymptotics of things like conformally compact manifolds. <clears throat> okay, so, so hypersurface, as I say, um, and I'll often call it sigma, um, <clears throat> just as a smoothly embedded code of mention one submanifold. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to restrict to the case that the sort of easy case, if you like, 
meaning um, that the co-normal field is going to be nowhere null along this hypersurface, right? That's that's mainly because in this sense, I or we are weak. Right? We, we don't know good ways of dealing with the null case. I mean, actually, we know an awful lot, and there's a lot to say, but it, it's kind of messy, um, <clears throat> whereas some beautiful things happen in this case. Uh, um, so we're going to assume that. Um, and then if that happens in, in any signature, then the, a metric from the conformal class determines a metric on your hypersurface. So I guess I should start drawing pictures. <clears throat> so we have some conformal manifold. <clears throat> and then we have some hypersurface inside our conformal manifold. And I'm calling that sigma. So here, if you pick a metric from the conformal class, then this metric will induce on sigma a metric. But if you multiply this by omega squared, then it'll induce a different metric on there, which is conformally related. So the, so, so this gets its own conformal stru structure just induced from the ambient conformal structure, right? <clears throat> okay. Now, um, it's natural to work with these weight one uh, co-normals. So, so if you were working with a metric, you would typically take an, a normal field along the uh, hypersurface. <clears throat> and depending on the signature, this would have length plus or minus one. But we'll be using the conformal metric, which has weight minus two, remember. So... <clears throat> If we want this to be plus or minus one, again, depending on signature and so on, <clears throat> then these better have weight one each to cancel out that minus two. So, <clears throat> well, thinking of it another way, when you rescale, if you were working with a metric and that were a metric, when you rescale this like this, this would scale but to an omega to the minus two, and you'd want to scale those things to cancel that out. <clears throat> okay, so that's just a sort of basic setup. Apart from what we're talking about, hypersurfaces in general, one of the reasons they're so important is, is you know, the boundary of the dom our domain is a hypersurface and the boundary of manifolds with boundaries. So if you want to do sort of PDE theory in mathematics or you want to do um, the corresponding uh, things in physics, you, you need to understand hypersurfaces. Okay, now... Um, <clears throat> Usually, I assume people have taught some <laughs> uh, basic um, submanifold theory, but I guess a lot of you are at the point of learning rather than teaching. So, so how does it work usually? So, um, <clears throat> let me draw a picture again, a bigger picture this time. Okay, suppose you're in Romanian setting. So here, here's your piece of hypersurface. And suppose you, 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 you have a manifold with a metric. <clears throat> then along your hypersurface, you would have, you know, your co-normal. <clears throat> and you can see that it's, it's turning as you go along the manifold. From that, <clears throat> um, you make an object called the second fundamental form. So what is the second fundamental form? And, and Yarek made me change it to K. <laughs> Because he says physicists use K, is that right? Oh, damn, I have some L's. Okay, well, where's the L? Ah, that one, that, that one should be a K, yep. Well, I blame Yarek for inconsistent notation. <laughs> it's always K. If you see an L, it's K. Um, so, so basically, what you do is you take the covariant derivative the ambient covariant derivative determined by metric and differentiate this, this unit normal along the hypersurface. So you only do this, you know, let's put a bar over this or something just to say that you're doing it only, you, you can only feed in vectors that are tangent to the hypersurface. So that, that, that measures um, um, a sort of turning of that normal. And, and in particular, if you... <clears throat> If you anyway just restrict this thing to to um, the tangent bundle to sigma, <clears throat> so in other words, you you feed in two vectors from from two vector fields from sigma, 
<coughs> then you know that will force this to be tangential and then that gives you <coughs> the second fundamental form so if u and v well, let's just write it ua va so <coughs> ua va uh, sections of this thing <laughs> right so you can track them into there then that's giving us what kab ua ub is <coughs> Okay, so that, that's the, the second fundamental form, and that's the sort of basic object where you, you know, for starting to do um, submanifold theory. Now, it's not conformally invariant, so if I construct it like that, <clears throat> and then, um, by the way, here, here I'm sort of giving a formula for it. If you extend n off, off the hypersurface smoothly, but still as a unit vector, then this is a sort of useful formula for it, which... Um, you can apply to ambient vectors, um, <clears throat> but but along the hypersurface, it's sort of forcing this projection. <clears throat> okay, so okay, what happens to it conformally? So so we do all that in the Riemannian setting, and then we change our mind about the metric by by <clears throat> going to this G hat metric, which is <clears throat> conformally related to the original one. Then it it changes, but notice it only changes by trace, right? So so the way the second fundamental form transforms picks up a derivative of the conformal factor. Here's the way I've, I've actually, instead of using the big omega, I've, I've taken a log and I'm doing e to the two omega g. Right? So g hat is e to the two omega g, where omega is a smooth function and I'm taking its exponential like that. <clears throat> and then epsilon that's turning up here is just the d of omega. Um, <clears throat> so what we see G, G bar is the induced conformal metric on the on the hypersurface. Yeah, thank you. So, as I said, you get an induced conformal structure here, and so you know it's important too. It has its own conformal structure, so it has its own conformal metric. Okay, <clears throat> so the trace-free part of the second fundamental form is actually conformally invariant. That's good. The, the the mean curvature, which I'm writing here, and that should have been k, <clears throat> is not conformally invariant, but we we are, we learn from this what its conformal transformation is. And I'm reminding you here that d is always n plus one. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now something very simple and good happens because we want to build up a conformally invariant way with dealing with hypersurfaces, and it turns out that's really easy. Um, so, <clears throat> so from above, we can work out that the mean curvature transforms in this simple way. So the mean curvature with respect to this new metric, e to the 2 omega g, is just the old mean curvature, thought of now as a density, so um, plus <clears throat> the, the, the normal or co-normal, but contracted and using the conformal metric, into the derivative of the conformal factor, okay? So, so that has a simple transformation. And that means that if we form this tractor where we put zero in the top slot, we're going to do this along the, the hypersurface. We put zero in the top slot. <laughs> That's easy. We put the co-normal in the middle slot, right? This, this N has weight one, so it's exactly the right weight to go into the middle of a tractor to make this have weight zero and we put minus the mean curvature in the bottom slot, then this transforms in the correct way. It is an invariant tractor then along the surface, right? So the, the, you remember the hallmark of an invariant tractor is this sort of transformation um, that was on the board yesterday, but it's not there today. Okay, so this is what we call the normal tractor. It's back from this old paper. Um, <clears throat> so that's conformally invariant and associated to your to your hypersurface. So, so as well as this co-normal, we have a sort of <laughs> normal tractor. <laughs> I'm drawing it here. So in inverted commas, it's living in the tractor bundle, but along the, the submanifold. Okay. What happens if we differentiate it tangentially along sigma? So remember to get the ordinary second fundamental form, <clears throat> you just differentiate the co-normal along the surface. So what happens if we differentiate this tractor normal? Okay, well, let's call this thing the shape operator. So this now is the tractor connection, but this underscore means I'm differentiating just in tangential directions. Then you just calculate, and what you get automatically is zero in the top slot. That's good. 
you get the trace-free second fundamental form in the middle slot. We knew that was conformally invariant. <clears throat> and then a divergence of that in the bottom slot. So it's just sort of a prolongation, if you like, of the um, second fundamental form. And by the way, that divergence, that should have a bar over it or something. That's the... Um, you know, the sub-manifold induced levy sevita connection there. <clears throat> okay. So, what's that? Down here? Um, okay, yeah. So, what it says is, <clears throat> okay. So, it says that a sub-manifold, and that, thanks for asking, is totally umbilic if and only if this normal tract is parallel, right? So, <clears throat> So we now have this normal tractor. So you, and it's natural to ask, what would it mean for that to be parallel along the, the submanifold, right? Now, in Riemannian geometry, if the co-normal's parallel along a Riemannian hypersurface, what's the hypersurface? Totally, totally geodesic. <laughs> I got an answer. So good. So it's totally geodesic. This time, if this normal tract is parallel along thing, then it's totally umbilic, okay? Which is weaker than totally geodesic, but it's conformally invariant. Now, in Romanian signature, umbilicity is, so to say it's umbilic, it means that it's sort of sphere-like at a point, right? So in particular, spheres in Euclidean space are totally umbilic, right? <clears throat> so are planes. So planes are totally geodesic, they're infinite spheres. So um, a hypersurface in Riemannian signature is totally umbilic if it's sort of sphere-like up to quadratic order. So in, in Riemannian signature, it's measuring the failure of that. And then in other signatures, you know, it depends on the signature, but it, it's a sort of a equivalent quantity. Okay, well, because this is so totally umbilic by definition just means the trace-free second fundamental form vanishes. And, and, and what this shape operator, if the trace free second fundamental form vanishes, then so does this derivative of n along the surface and conversely, right? Because it's just the prolongation of that. Okay, so we've nicely captured that in a sense <clears throat> in a quantity. Um, okay, now the next thing, you know, if you're teaching hyper uh, sort of submanifolds or if you're learning it, is the Gauss formula. So the Gauss formula um, tells you how to relate um, the, the intrinsic Levi-Civita connection to the ambient one, right? So let's look at our picture again. So suppose you have a hypersurface in Romanian geometry, right? It, it gets induced on it, a metric. So this, so this gets its own metric, let's call it, am I calling it G-bar? So the induced metric on this hypersurface. So this thing gets its own Levi-Civita connection you know, has a life of its own, <laughs> feels important. But on the other hand, you have the ambient levy sevita connection and how are they related along the hypersurface? Well, that's the Gauss formula, right? So, so the, the ambient levy sevita connection, but differentiating in directions tangent and acting on vector fields, which are um, tangent to the submanifold is the same as the intrinsic levy sevita connection and um, um, acting on that up to this term, which involves the, tr the second fundamental form. And this is actually often used as another way of defining the second fundamental form. So, so <clears throat> this second fundamental form is measuring, if you like, the failure of the intrinsic um, induced connection to the second fundamental form. <clears throat> All right. Now, so we would like to do the same thing with tractors, right? So because we have this normal tractor, and we have our ambient tractor connection. We have an induced conformal structure on our submanifold. So, so this hypersurface gets its own tractor bundle and everything. Again, it feels important. It's got all this stuff too. But how do you compare it to the ambient one, right? So that's the idea of a Gauss formula. <clears throat> okay, now we've got a problem, Houston. <laughs> so the, the point is here... Um, what we used in understanding the Gauss formula was that the tangent bundle to sigma uh, is sort of in a very easy way isomorphic to the to n perp, right? So we have a co-normal, and along the submanifold, uh, you can identify 
um, the tangent bundle to the submanifold with M pert sitting inside the tangent bundle to M along the submanifold. Yeah. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> yeah. Now, the, the problem is here is that, that we have an ambient tractor bundle and we have an intrinsic tractor bundle. And so, <clears throat> you know, is, is the same thing true? Well, it turns out that actually it is, but it's not trivial. <laughs> it's, well, it's not completely trivial. It's not too hard. So <clears throat> we have this ambient tractor bundle. And, and <clears throat> what you would like is that the intrinsic tractor bundle of the submanifold can be identified with n perp. Very echoey in here. <clears throat> um, and it turns out this is true. So, um, but it's an isomorphism to the tractor bundle of sigma. So that's what's in, in here. And the way this happens is if you look at n perp, well, this is a, the submanifold of the ambient tractor bundle, but along sigma, and I'm writing it in terms of some metric. Um, <clears throat> if you map it to those three slots, so that's sigma mu and that's rho in the bottom slot, to sigma, and then you adjust mu with some amount of the mean curvature, and you adjust the rho at the bottom with some amount of a half the mean curvature squared times sigma, then you get the right triple for the, um, <clears throat> for the tractor bundle of the submanifold. The point to one thing to observe is that if you if you pick a scale so the mean curvature is zero and you can always do that from the conformal class then the three slots just agree okay so there is a canonical isomorphism it's conformally invariant and so on so we can make this comparison let's do it <clears throat> okay so so now we have two connections so T, T bars, what I've called T sigma here. So T with an overline is, is the tractor bundle of the submanifold. N perp is the subbundle of the ambient um, tractor bundle, which we can identify with this, this T bar. So now we get two connections on, on this T bar. So um, it has its own intrinsic tractor connection, just induced from the conformal structure on there. <clears throat> okay, so strictly at the moment, that would mean that sigma has to mention at least three, right? Because we need um, <clears throat> we need the sort of the dimension to be at least three to get its own tractor connection. Actually, everything works with <laughs> slightly more statements in any case. So I'll just ignore that aspect. <clears throat> okay, so, so this will have its own tractor bundle and it'll have its own tractor connection. And on the other hand, we can take the ambient tractor connection and, and we can do this trick, right? So you take a section of, of the intrinsic tractor bundle U, but identify that with a section that we'll also call U of N perp. Now we can hit it with the ambient tractor connection, but in directions along the hypersurface. That's what that projection pi means. So that's a projection. And, and then when we've done that, we can project the answer into the submanifold tractors because we have this normal um, tractor so we can we can make projection operators in the obvious way so so we take the identity endomorphism on tractors you know say you're in Romanian signature and so on it would be minus mb in a and that will give you a projection <coughs> um, along the hypersurface from the from ambient tractors into n perp, and then we can identify that with the submanifold. Now, this sort of trick always works for making a connection. It's easy to see that that's a connection. So this is another conformally invariant connection along the um, hypersurface, and we want to compare the two. This is the analog of the Gauss formula, right? <clears throat> now, the only thing is a couple, two, two things happen here. So, um, <clears throat> Okay, so we, so we get an extra term compared to the Romanian case. So, so here we're taking V to be a section of the submanifold tractor bundle or, or N perp. We're just identifying those two. And here's the intrinsic tractor connection of the submanifold. And these things are differing by two terms. So the first two terms put together 
that's the projected connection. That's the thing we call the check connection sometimes. That's this one here. So that grad tilde is those first two parts. <clears throat> and then here is this um, conformal shape operator that we had on the previous slide, giving us, in a sense, the, the, the term that we had. You know, this is an obvious analog of the Gauss formula in the Romanian case, or the, this, you know, <clears throat> usual case. Here we get this extra term. So this S is the difference between the intrinsic tractor connection and the projected one. So, so the, you know, this part here, um, there's the intrinsic tractor connection and the two of them add up to this tilted connection. So there's one more term and this S is capturing, it's putting in tractors a thing called the Fialkov tensor. So, you know, by construction, this has to be conformally invariant. And this is... This was a tensor that was, you know, known to Fialkov, um, turned up in other things. So, so that gives you the difference between those things. Okay, well, the details, I don't expect you to absorb all those details, but my, the main thing is, you know, this is kind of an easy concept. You, you're just comparing these different connections that you can get, and then you can just compute what happens. So, you know, this was even done... So Stafford <coughs> um, produced these formulas first. He was a master's student, you know, so he... He did this at the end of his undergrad and stuff and so on. So it's not hard to do these calculations. <clears throat> the Atkin was a following PhD student who extended things a bit. Okay, so let's say we're experts in submanifolds now. There's a sort of dot, 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 right? So you can now use that machinery, for instance, to proliferate submanifold invariants and so on in a conformally invariant way. So, you know, that's a track you could go down. Um, but we want to get back to our sort of purpose of understanding uh, conformally compact manifolds and so on. <clears throat> so given a conformally compact manifold, here's my usual cartoon of one. Um, so remember, we have a, a physical metric G plus or um, a geometric one if we're, if we're mathematicians. <clears throat> and then we have this um, boundary at infinity. And, you know, the thing is conformally compact in the way I was talking about before. So, so here are some questions, you know, so that remember this boundary gets a conformal structure. So how is that conformal geometry linked to this interior geometry? So that's sort of one of the, you know, big problems. Um, also in the Fiffman Graham program that I mentioned, how do you, you know, understand and work out asymptotics of G plus near that manifold in a, in a useful way? Um, and then, um, <clears throat> yeah, and then what about extrinsic geometry of this thing? So think of this as a hypersurface embedded in this manifold. What about um, the extrinsic geometry of that? What can you say about that? And, and depending on what's happening, you know, so for instance, may, maybe this is conformally compact, but maybe it's also Poincaré-Einstein, so in some way. So maybe it's a space-time and we're asking some sort of Einstein equations. How, how does that affect these asymptotics? <clears throat> okay, so we're in the conformally compact setting. And remember, we'll understand that in terms of the scale tractor. So... Um, <clears throat> I've rubbed out my main scale tractor on the board, but here it is here. So I is going to be sigma, grad sigma, and this Laplacian term. Um, and so we'll understand a um, uh, conformally compact manifold as a conformal manifold with, with such a scale tractor. And this I squared will be not zero for us in this case. Um, <clears throat> now, I want to make a further restriction just to, um, you, you, you can get by without this, but to, to make our life sort of reasonably civilized, I'm going to ask that I squared its length approaches plus or minus one asymptotically in some sense, okay? Now, because I'm saying it with tractors, it sounds very random, but actually this, this is what people usually do. So um, if you're in Romanian signature, it makes it asymptotically hyperbolic if you ask I squared to become... Uh, one as you go towards the boundary. So it's the usual asymptotically hyperbolic assumption that people are making, okay? And it, it means that the sectional curvatures of the metric G plus are becoming minus one as you get to infinity in Romanian signature. And then in these um, 
GR type signatures, um, <clears throat> it, it would be anti de sitter um, <clears throat> if it's plus. So it would be becoming asymptotically anti de sitter as you go to the boundary. Um, or if, if it's minus, it's becoming asymptotically de sitter as you go to the boundary, right? Remember that was <clears throat> in the models, the, the, you know, this was sort of plus or minus one on the nose, or actually, you know, we had a cosmological constant lambda, but if we'd normalized things, it would be like that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, now th there's something good that happens when we do this, right? <laughs> so when we assume this this sort of asymptotic condition that people usually assume, then then something happens that's so good, I said it's beautiful here, right? So <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it's an agreement of the scale tractor with the normal tractor. Okay, so 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 the normal tractor we were just talking about is what you need to to easily access all these conformal invariants of hypersurfaces. But the amazing thing is that the scale tractor, which on the inside is telling us about the metric and so on, is going to agree on the nose with the normal tractor if we make this assumption. So here's the proposition. So suppose you have one of these almost pseudo Romanian structures with the scale singularity set sigma, right? So you know, these are very weak assumptions, but I am going to assume that I squared um, is plus or minus one along the zero locus. And um, and and as you go off, you know, it, 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 it's not but necessarily, but it's, it's sort of by sigma squared F. Now, sigma is a defining function for the zero locus. So you can think of this sigma as like a coordinate defining the, this boundary. So this is at, if you think of it as a coordinate x, this is at order x squared, it starts to be not plus or minus one. If you have agreement to that level, <coughs> um, then sigma is going to be forced to be a smoothly embedded hypersurface. We already talked about why that happens. Um, but also, <coughs> n is going to agree on the nose with the restriction of the scale tractor to, to the zero locus. Any questions about the statement? <laughs> Good. What what if we if we have the if we have the linear transaction? I mean if we don't have six squares but the sigma transaction. Yeah, then then this fails. <laughs> it's not quite, you know, so it doesn't quite match. Yeah. So th this is the order that you need that to match. But say at anything Well, you can do everything without assuming this at all, right? So you can if if I squared is just nowhere vanishing, then you get this nice separating hypersurface. It's just that when when you're talking about um, you know what what the geometry is, you're going to have terms involving the derivative of sigma because along the boundary, if the derivative of sigma is not constant, then that becomes part of your data. So yeah, so it it just makes that bit more complicated. So. But you can do everything. Yeah, it's this is just simplifying, but this is also the usual setting. So this is why it's 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 massively simplifying, and it's what people are doing anyway if they're not doing tractors and things. Right? It, it because it's turned up for other reasons that it was a good <laughs> good assumption. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So here here's the proof. But instead of putting the sigma squared, let's just, because that, you know, that's just making it work to this order. Let's just assume that I squared is plus or minus one. What, here's a sketch of the proof, right? So, and it's very easy because, um, <clears throat> so as usual, sigma is, is the contraction of the scale tractor into the canonical tractor X. And along the zero locus, that's with sigma zero, of course you have zero in the top slot, right? <laughs> because that, you know, that, that this is, we're along sigma, we're, we're sigma zero in the top slot sigma. The next slot is the derivative of sigma. And because I squares the plus or minus one, if you look at that tractor formula now, it's just saying that this grad sigma squares the plus or minus one along the zero locus. Now, sigma has weight one, so it's derivative has weight one. So this just is the unit co-normal then along the boundary, right? So we get zero N. Now in this normal tractor, we had minus the mean curvature, but then just a little computation, which can be one of your exercises, is that if you assume that, you know, one plus sigma squared, then actually this Laplacian of sigma ends up giving the mean curvature on the nose, right, like that. So the thing that's turning on the bottom slot just turns into the mean curvature. So isn't that wonderful, right? So it just produces this normal tractor. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. 
Now, he, here's a sort of corollary of this. Um, <clears throat> so, so you can start to see these tools coming into play here in this corollary, right? So this is now just for free. So <clears throat> suppose that you have a, an almost pseudo Riemannian manifold with the singularity set where sigma is zero, not, you know, not empty, right? <clears throat> and and as, assume that it's asymptotically Einstein in the sense that I squared along the boundary is plus or minus one, okay? So <clears throat> if, it's, if it's asymptotically Einstein, <clears throat> then you would expect I, I squared to be constant, right? That's what, because Einstein would mean the scale tractor had, it was parallel and therefore would have constant length. So we're going to ask that it be plus or minus one. And that the derivative of the scale tractor is not necessarily zero, but it's order sigma at the boundary. So it's sort of like X of X is your defining function. Okay, so, so the derivative of i vanishes along the boundary. Then automatically, this zero locus has to be totally umbilic. Okay, so have I got the proof on the next page? Uh, no, so I'll go back. Okay, so, so why is it totally umbilic? Um, <clears throat> well, so perhaps people can see an answer. <laughs> so, okay, so if if... If the derivative of i is, is sigma times something, let's create a bit of space. Yeah, so, so we have the derivative of i is, is, is sigma times something smooth, right? So if we contract this with another i, then what you get is that the derivative of i squared is sigma times something along the boundary, <clears throat> um, which means because i squared was plus or minus one at the boundary, and now the derivative of i squared is sigma, then what you end up concluding is that i squared is plus or minus one plus sigma squared times something smooth to the boundary. And therefore, along the boundary, i is going to agree with the normal tractor from the previous result, and, but 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 I is parallel along the boundary because of this condition. So that means the normal tract is parallel along the boundary. And so it's totally umbilic from that previous result. So asymptotically Einstein imp implies totally umbilic. That's seeing it from this perspective. This again, people like Lebrun had noticed this in dimension four and, and certain settings and that. So, but this you you see now that these things just come for free, basically. Um it, it you know. You're just loading this up so it doesn't look quite for free. But trust me, there's very little going on here in, in the sort of what you have to do to compute that. <clears throat> Is there any uh, difference between topological constant equals to zero and topological non-zero constant? Huge difference between zero and not. But I once it's... I know that there is difference. But yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm always separating the case when, 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 the, when, so it, it, if I squared a zero, right, then, then the boundary is null and so on. Yeah. That, and then we're in, then we're in this tough world that I don't want to go into in these talks, but, but there are things we can say. But, but yeah, but as soon as it's not zero, it doesn't really matter whether it's one or 50,000 or something, right? It, it, it's just, uh, yeah, it's to do with the scalar curvature. Okay. Now, just going slightly further than that, you know, under what circumstances do the tractor connections agree? So, <clears throat> um, remember, we we had this um, Gauss-type formula that says that the induced tractor connection will typically be different to the ambient one. But if you're asymptotically Einstein, then they agree, right? So, if we assume slightly stronger than than um, the previous slide, so in the previous slide, I had grad, grad I was... Um, just sigma times something, but now suppose I assume that it's sigma squared times something, <clears throat> um, then everything works from the previous page, but just a little bit more, namely we can define the curvature. And by the way, I didn't write that down, so maybe I'll put that somewhere. So we have a tractor connection. So it has curvature and abstract indices. 
you know, this is given by acting on a vector field. Uh, the notation I'm using here is kappa A, B, C, D, B, D, right? So it's just the curvature of this tractor connection. And then when you write this with respect to a metric from the conformal class, this looks like... <clears throat> Okay, it has the vial curvature. Oops. Has the vial curvature in it. Um, it has the cotton tensor in it. So C, A, B, D or something. And minus C, A, B, C. I think if I've got the signs right, but and zero down here. But the details don't matter much. This is the vial tensor. This is the cotton tensor. Um, so C, A, B, D is two in my notation. Grad A, this scouting D. I think, I think those conventions are about right, right? So this is this trace adjustment of Ricci, the scouting tensor. We're taking a kind of curl of it with the levi sevita connection. This is not conformally invariant. This gives the thing called the cotton tensor. I used to call it cotton york until Pavel yelled at me enough to stop putting the york in, claiming that cotton <laughs> had known about it like 50 years before york or something. So, um, so <clears throat> um, right. So, <clears throat> okay. So if, if this is parallel to that order, then of course it's going to kill the tractor curvature along the surface. Because if I now put an I in here, <clears throat> if this is parallel, then this would be zero, right? So, and if it's parallel to that order, that's going to happen along the hypersurface to that order. So you'll get that the, the tractor curvature has to kill this scale tractor along the boundary. The scale tractor is the normal tractor along the boundary. And then you can conclude that the normal into the vial curvature is zero along the boundary. And more stuff, you know, you can play this game to, to all sorts of orders and get a lot more information about what happens along the boundary. So the vial curvature, um, if you're asymptotically Einstein to this order, the vial curvature has to have nullity along the boundary. And so for instance, if you're in Romanian signature and in dimension four, what would happen to the vial curvature along the boundary? It would be zero, right? Because, because once it has nullity, it's easy to show in dimension four that it has to vanish. So, you know, and that again, you know, that's a classically known result, but you see it's just coming out for free now. Um, <clears throat> and then um, also um, this Fialkov tensor. So this, this vial into N and the fact that we're umbilic means that this Fialkov vanishes along the boundary <laughs> as well, if, if you have asymptotics to that order. So the Einstein condition is, is pushing in some, some information about the the embedding of your submanifold, the extrinsic invariants. So these are these are conformal invariants that have to vanish. Or if you like, they if they don't, there are abstractions to it being an Einstein on the inside. Uh, um, okay, well, putting these things together, if you have this level of asymptotics, now the Fialkov's vanished, um, <clears throat> the the normals parallel, and so on. You can actually conclude that. From what we were talking about before, submanifolds that that if you're on um, this conformally compact manifold and you're at this boundary, it has this conformal structure. And if this is Einstein to that order, then the tractor bundle of the boundary, the its intrinsic one, actually agrees with the ambient one along the boundary. The parallel transport agrees once you have asymptotically. Um, Einstein to that order. I'm going way too slow. <laughs> um, all right, so here, here's a summary to this point. So, um, well, this is a summary of some things that are, we haven't talked about all of them, but but these are some a combination of what we've talked about and and some other things. So, so what you know if you're um, in this setting. So you, you have a conformally compact manifold. Here it is. G plus, here's your boundary at infinity. Suppose that this is um, asymptotically Einstein. So, so what's happening? 
Well, if it's asymptotically, um, if I squared becomes plus or minus one at the boundary, that, that's what I said, it's this usual condition that people are assuming. It's in Romanian signature, it's asymptotically hyperbolic and so on. Then, then the metric, so this corresponds to I squared equals plus or minus one plus sigma. Then the metric, that, sorry, the Romanian curvature, now this is G plus, sorry. So really this G is G plus now. So it looks like plus or minus um, just those Gs plus an order sigma to the minus three term, right? Now you might say, well, hang on, that thing's blowing up really fast because <laughs> the boundaries were sigma zero. <clears throat> but the, this is blowing up at order sigma to the minus four. So the leading term is that part there. Now, uh, we haven't talked about this, but this is a sort of old thing. You know, if you look in some of Graham's notes or something like that on, on, the, on the situation, you'll find this, this calculation done. But, it, but it was, it's not due to Graham either. I mean, it's very old that, 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 the, that the curvature um, is becoming um, asymptotically the leading term looks like that. So in other words, the sectional curvature is becoming constant. <clears throat> so this, this is just a sort of well-known thing. What we just showed is that um, if we assume that um, it, it's um, asymptotically Einstein of a, just a little bit higher order, I haven't stated that here, but I should have really, um, <clears throat> then, then it has to be totally umbilic then the Fyokov has to vanish. And then there's more things that happen. And then there's this article um, with, with um, Blitz and Yarrick and, and Waldron talking about sort of even more things that you can say. <clears throat> um, but we observed part of that just now, like the, the, the normal into the vial vanishes. And then <clears throat> um, what about the intrinsic geometry of the boundary? Well, one well-known thing going back to Fiffman Graham is that if the boundary is even dimensional, so the bulk is odd dimensional, and, and you have a smooth, you know, so everything I'm talking about is smooth, so a smooth um, conformally compact metric with that property, then actually a thing called the uh, Pfeffman Graham tensor of this conformal boundary has to vanish. And if that boundary is dimension four, this is the Bach tensor. So if, you, if your ambient manifold is dimension five and your boundary is dimension four, and this and this is um, Einstein or asymptotically Einstein to high enough order, then the boundary has to be Bach flat. So Bach is a well-known tensor and conformal geometry. I haven't talked about that. I won't get to that far in the, these talks, but um, that's a sort of well another well-known thing. Okay, so what I want to finish with, and this will end up being <laughs> fairly quick, um, is 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 linked to scattering. Um, <clears throat> So again, my pictures all reflect the Romanian case, but you can imagine doing this also in, in for instance, um, de Sitter or asymptotically de Sitter and so on. So what we're not talking about is the Ricci flat case. <clears throat> okay, so, so suppose you have one of these conformally compact manifolds and on the interior, you want to solve this equation. So, so you have your interior metric, which so G plus and G are the same now, right? So... So uh, I'm saying that here just because I have old pictures and new stuff. I don't want to change it all. So, <clears throat> but you want to solve Laplacian plus S. S is, let's say, a real number. Um, actually, it's often taken to be complex, but we'll just keep it real. N minus S. Um, and then this uh, trace of Scouten over D times F equals zero. This is, this is uh, you know, this is not sort of um, ad hoc. This is what people usually study, this operator. And I'll say a bit more about that. But <clears throat> now, because we have this conformal compactifications, you know, what are the right sort of boundary conditions? Because the boundary is now at infinity, right? So it's not, <laughs> you know, in a manifold with boundary, you would talk about, this is a second order operator. You'd talk about Dirichlet conditions, namely just specifying a function on the boundary and Neumann conditions like one normal derivative on the boundary or something like that. Okay. Um, and then in, in, you know, in Lorentzian signature, this would become a wave operator and you have to think about those conditions a bit differently, but you, you still end up looking at the same objects and they have different interpretations. <clears throat> but yeah, what is the natural sort of, you know, how can you get to the boundary stuff because it's at infinity now? So remember, you know, that metric that we're writing that in, so let's just go back. So when we write that, this metric is singular at this boundary, right? So this metric is blowing up. <clears throat> now, 
<clears throat> now, so as I was saying before, when you're on a Riemannian manifold, it's natural to couple the metric to 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 everything, right? So you make the Laplacian, as I said before, it, it's the metric that's part of your data in Riemannian manifold, the levi sevita connection, <clears throat> and you, you form some Laplacian. This is a kind of natural coupling. Now, now we can play other games like that because <clears throat> we're actually thinking of our, our almost pseudo Riemannian manifold as a conformal manifold plus the scale tractor, right? So instead of just using the metric, we can also use the scale tractor to couple things. So, <clears throat> um, and you know, it's this is like Lego. <laughs> we have um, this this I sitting around with a one tractor index, and <clears throat> we have this Thomas D sitting around with one tractor index. So why not contract them and see what happens, right? So <laughs> you can make it make an operator I dot D, right? It's just sort of. You know, when you're playing in the sandpit, this is just something you do, right? So, so what have you done? So, well, you'll see here you've made a big mess actually. But so, first of all, D lowers weight by one, I has weight zero. So, this is going to be something that could operate on weighted tractor bundles and it will lower weight by one. This big phi means any tractor bundle, really. So, but you can just think of densities too, if you like. So, this I dot D will just lower weight by one. Now, in discussing this, I want to introduce a weight operator, namely, if you act on things with weight, it will just spit out the weight, right? So bold W on beta for some section beta of, of this bundle of weight to W0 will spit out the W0. So this I dot D operator, you know, here, here it is. So here's the scale tractor. And then I'm contracting it into the Thomas D operator, right? So, so this will be just matrix multiplication. The sigma will multiply that bit. The, the nabla sigma will contract into the middle bit. And this will multiply the top bit to make the new operator, right? Everyone see that? And you, and you get this um, unholy mess on the bottom, right? So, so you're going to get sigma times the Laplacian, some sort of first order operator, some sort of zero to the terms that look very complicated. So you might feel like you've made a big mistake. <clears throat> but persisting, remember that when you calculate in the scale of sigma, sigma is parallel, right? So, so what happens on the interior? So we, if we look at this thing, when we go to the interior and we calculate in the scale of sigma, then all these derivatives of sigma will go away. And we'll end up with this term, that term will be gone, that term will be gone, and we'll end up with that, right? So on the interior, this becomes just, you know, <clears throat> actually, you know, right onto that thing that we wanted to study. So this, this scattering type Laplacian. So <clears throat> in fact, if you take the scalar curvature um, to, be, to, to be minus you know, take the scalar curvature to be constant, and so so it's minus d d minus one. This is a sort of one of the normal ways one um, people normalize the scalar curvature. So this is what it is true in um, <clears throat> you know the so hyperbolic space. So 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 the scalar curvature is minus d d minus one. That's what it is in hyperbolic space. So people are ob often working in, with the restriction that the scalar curvature satisfies that. Then this I dot D operator on the interior, and when you trivialize the density bundles, in other words, you sort of set sigma to one, this just becomes minus the Laplacian plus, plus or minus S, depending on the signature, N, N minus S. This is the usual scattering eigenproblem that people study just on the nose, and this S is called the scattering problem. So this I dot D is just sort of magically just producing this on the nose. Um, and, and this is with you, you relabel S to be D plus W minus one. All right. <clears throat> so, so solutions on the interior, let's say we take this constant scalar curvature condition, um, are, are um, eigenvectors of the Laplacian, right? So this is, so as S varies, you're, you're going over the spectrum of the Laplacian or the wave operator if you're in, um, <clears throat> in the Rentzian signature or the Eitre ultra hyperbolic Laplacian or whatever if you're in other signatures. So um, now, but what, so that's what happens on the interior. What does this I dot do, D do on the boundary? Well, actually, if we go back to the formula for it, 
So on the boundary, sigma is zero. So the leading Laplacian term is gone at zero, right? And you, this first order term is going to stay there. This grad sigma becomes the normal, right? So it's a normal derivative. And then, um, and, and yeah, we get the, you know, the sigma is zero. So, so, so some of these terms go away. And what you find is that on the boundary, <laughs> um, this i dot d operator just gives us a number times an operator I'm calling delta one. This is um, a well well known thing called the conformal Robin operator. So this is a conformally invariant normal operator that was um, first discovered by Cherrier and then later by Escobar. So <clears throat> you know this is something that's sort of used all the time. So so this i dot d operator is automatically producing that on the boundary and producing the scattering thing on the inside. So and you know this was stuff you found in the sandpit. You know so it's you know you 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 can see that it's sort of taking us in a good direction. So we call i dot d a degenerate Laplacian because it's second order on the interior to de de degenerates to this first order operator on the boundary, but in a useful way. Okay, but there's more parlor tricks. <laughs> so. What else is good about this? So, so you know, what you want to do is is on this conformally compact manifold is, is look at the asymptotics of solutions. Yeah, you want to know how they behave as you as you go to the boundary and and pick out sort of nice solutions. So it turns out <clears throat> that that um, a very simple thing happens. So remember, this i dot d operator was a big mess, right? So let, let's go back and enjoy it for a second. Right, so here it is, <laughs> right? So it, it looks nasty, but <clears throat> when you commute it with sigma, it just turns into something very simple. It just gives you I squared back and some weight operator. Now, actually, you know, the, if you do this, you call sigma X, you call Y minus one over I squared I dot D, let's assume I squared is not zero, and, and, and call this D plus two W as weight operator H, this is just a standard SL2, right? So it's generating an SL2. <clears throat> now, remember, at the boundary, sigma is, is, is like a coordinate going off the boundary. So, so you can use, and, and this i dot d is the operator we want to study. We want to study i dot d equals zero. So you can use this SL2 to study the asymptotics in, in a sort of easy way. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, <clears throat> Okay, so first of all, an observation. I better do this very quickly, but but basically, um, so so one thing you can do is you can you can recreate um, GJMS type operators on the boundary. So so if you take powers of this i dot d operator, then using this SL two, you will find that acting on things of an appropriate weight. So if we act on things of this weight. And we do this y to the k, right? So this is i dot d to the power of k. <clears throat> then um, at, at this weight, this operator becomes tangential along the boundary. In other words, it's fully invariant by construction. But when you take this power of it and act on this weight, it suddenly doesn't depend on how the thing is extended off the boundary at all. So it's producing actually a conformally invariant boundary operator. And these are what we call these extrinsic Laplacian powers. Now, if the interior is Einstein, this just spits out the GGMS operators, the famous Graham, Gene, Mason, Sparling powers of the Laplacian. But otherwise, it makes uh, generalizations of these that sort of capture the geometry. So I don't want to go into that given the time constraints. Um, okay, let's get back to our scattering problem. <clears throat> so this is just repeating um, what I was saying before. So... But what the point is we can use the SL2 to try and solve these scattering problems now, right? So suppose you want to solve this I dot D equals zero, right? And just think of, to compute the asymptotics, you can just imagine expanding in sigma. So remember, sigma is like a defining function for the boundary. So you imagine that you've solved it formally coming off the boundary. Now, by the way, you know, I dot D goes to the boundary. The, the, the operator on the interior is made out of a singular metric and everything so we didn't understand how that went to the boundary but now we've sort of understood in terms of i dot d i dot d just goes to the boundary smoothly it's a perfectly well defined so we can study i dot df instead of the original scattering thing and it's going to give us the right boundary conditions so suppose you've solved i dot d up to some order um, sigma l 
and then you you want to understand how to go one more order well you know you just do the obvious thing so so you've solved um, i dot d up to some order and then you 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 introduce this fl plus one and look at it at the next order and I, I, you know we don't have time to go through all the details now but if 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 you do that, then then of course you, you know your your y, which is your i dot d operator, is going to hit some power of sigma. So it's going to hit, in fact, the next term in the sequence, which will be sigma to the uh, l plus one times f um, l plus one. And 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 then by those SL two identities, it just spits out some numbers. So so and I've highlighted in blue. If that number's not zero, you can just keep going, right? So if you're at a sort of general weight like pi or you know some irrational number or something like that, this never stops, and you can just solve it to all orders formally using using these sort of identities. But if you're um, um, uh, at at a sort of integral weight, it may go wrong, right? So so you can keep going provided L is not equal to H naught over two. H is naught is is the sort of weight operator acting on the the thing you started with this F naught. Okay, <clears throat> then if if you get to L equals H naught over two, then then the, the then the problem is sort of obstructed. And you know, if you play around, you find it's obstructed exactly by these extrinsic Laplacian operators acting on the boundary data. So that we were talking about before. So so this this mimics what happened in the original GG, GJMS construction. And so what happens in the end is if the if the thing is um, almost Einstein to sufficiently high order, then the odd ones of these obstructions vanish, and the even ones give the usual GJMS operators. So that's very quick, but we're running out of time. But just to say, um, so that's one type of solution, right? We we did f naught plus sigma f naught and so on. What if we take sigma to some power of alpha times that? Can we get other solutions? Um, well, it's easy to see that generally not, right? Because when this i dot d hits the sigma alpha, then it'll 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 do something nasty to it, and we won't be able to get rid of this f naught. So, um, <clears throat> although this alpha may not be a, um, you know, it can be any any real number. Actually, this takes us out of SL two, but you still have this commutation relation. It's easy to show that. So, what you actually see is that you can solve this problem if and only if 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 the y commutes with that power of sigma and so you so basically um you can you 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 know you, you it tells you what power of alpha can be there so it has to commute with y um and um and once you put that in so it turns out that it'll be h naught minus one where h naught's the thing you're starting with then you have a first solution and then this power of h just commutes with it and then the second solution is just like a first solution but times sigma naught to the alpha in other words you don't have to repeat solving it you've, you've sort of solved it with the first case now this okay that's all very quick but the main point i want to make is that um <clears throat> this just produces on the nose these asymptotic behaviors that show up in scattering theory like in the the Graham's Worski type thing, which which was based on earlier scattering things and so on. So, so the um, <clears throat> you know they they use some initial uh, calculation and so on to work out the asymptotics. But here we're seeing that it's all coming from the SL two, and also we're seeing that that um, the the second solution is coming really because this i dot d operator commutes with certain powers of sigma using the SL two identities. Um, <clears throat> By the way, when when you hit this weight where things are abstracted, you can continue with log terms, and um, you know the i dot d operator actually knows how to deal with log terms as well. But I won't go into all that. The basic thing is that you can you can just compute all this kind of for free. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. No. So you showed to us this is how they then this this uh, six months really so I have two questions. So the first one is 
what condition uh, does one need to say the compass? And the other one is that if I understood correctly, with some extra assumption, you get this uh, contraction of n to the five. Uh, yeah. Damage. So, and I was wondering also if, if you don't make this extra assumption, what do you get? Do you get something like a repeated principle of non relation of the band or something? Because it reminds, it reminds me of the Dolby Cup theorem too. Uh huh. Okay, so the, the first thing to say is this is all going to be in tomorrow's lecture. <laughs> um, but basically, yeah, th there's a converse, and that was the point of the paper I mentioned, that um, you can you can write down these um, higher second... So the trace-free second minute fundamental form is an abstraction to Einstein, and then at that order, it's if and only if, you know? So if you just want the very first thing, that's the, the totally umbilicus, the first thing you need, and, and, and goes sort of both ways to that order. And then... The Fialkov is the next thing you need, and it's sort of if and only if to that order. And 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 we build um, in this paper, we build these abstractions right up to where you you start to hit the global information. So so you, you can give an if and only if uh, order by order <laughs> conditions for asymptotically Einstein. Yeah, but that it's anyway tomorrow, so probably shouldn't keep people over talking about it now. <laughs> Spoil tomorrow's punchline. Was that yeah? Did that get both questions in a sense, or yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. All right, I think people want coffee. <laughs> Thank you.